Yo, what's good, my guy? My guy. What's good out here, Kyle? How you doing? All right. To today, we got the man, the myth, the legend, Coach Furs on the KML interview. Honored to have you as my guest for today. So let's get right into it. Coach Furr, give me a little uh, background information on yourself and uh, what you do in the baseball world. Well, I was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and a place called Coney Island. Uh, I have been coaching now. I mean, I, I obviously fell in love with baseball at a real young age and, um, you know, always had a passion for it. But I did other things after college and playing before I got back into coaching. And since I got back, I probably got about 11 years back coaching. And, um, you know, primarily, I would say working with players on and off the field, training guys, uh, and also running a team. I don't have multiple teams, but I run one team per year um, that is just a group of guys that I try to help get them matched up with the good college, you know, a good college program that's going to suit um, you know, what their physical skills are and their academics, obviously. And, um, you know, I've had pretty good success with that. I mean, mo most of the guys that I've worked with, we found some kind of college for them somewhere. So I feel like that's the, the probably the biggest thing I do is, is streamline the recruitment process for uh, high school age kids. Definitely. But some of the guys that I've worked with, obviously over the way, now those guys are older. So I have pro guys. Now I got a lot yeah. of guys college and NCAA now and I got a couple I got a lot quite a few guys in pro ball and I got a couple of guys in the big leagues so you know yeah. if you coach I think if you coach for over a decade you'll start to see that but it takes about a decade for, for, for those things to happen those guys to grow up the results yeah with like you talking about the recruiting process and helping out with that what is the biggest mistakes kids make in the recruiting process um, I think some of the biggest mistakes kids make is There's like a fine line between setting a high goal for yourself and also being realistic. Yeah, definitely. You know, and I feel like uh, I feel like a lot of kids would help them if they were somewhere, something where you have to reach and you gotta, you have to work your ass off, but you're still in a realistic situation. So it's not only knowing it's some people say it's knowing your ceiling, yeah. maybe also you know, knowing your floor. You know, knowing your ceiling and not just with physical ability. I know some kids that, you know, they end up going to a school where they got offered and the academics are out of control. Yeah. And the workload, they get stressed out. It's not even a baseball thing. You know, typically most humans, they're, <clears throat> they have, I think almost everybody has a talent or a gift. But, you know, being super gifted athletically and then being super gifted academically not so many people have both of those the guys that the few people that do are almost outliers they're a little bit weird right yeah definitely they're different mm -hmm. but I, I would say i would say setting setting attainable goals but um you know not it, it's it's tough because you want to tell a kid you want to tell everybody dream big you know and 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 don't let anybody tell you, you can't do anything and then you also have to be realistic in the fact that you know we all have mm -hmm. genetics and we're born with certain gifts to be able to throw hard, hit a ball this hard, uh, you know, and 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 uh, there is a college program for every single kid, I believe, that wants to play baseball. Definitely. It right. might just be D3 or D2 or JUCO for some guys, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. As my uh, Coach Byer for my uh, varsity team for school ball, there's a place for everyone in this game. Uh, as we're talking about the recruiting process, what do college coaches really want to see in a player? Like, what do, I, what do players not know that they're looking at, et cetera? I think one of the things that I think everybody knows that it has to start with the physical ability, right? It has For a college coach, when they look at a guy, I mean, it, the physical aspect of it, it, it always starts there with everything because if you don't if you can't they know mathematically what you have to do in order to play at the speed of which they play yeah oh so so if for instance if i'm a shortstop right mm -hmm. in high school and i want to play at an acc program 
I think probably have to be able to make a play from the time it hits the, the time that you make the guy makes contact the hitter to the time I field it and throw it to first base. It needs to be 4.1 seconds. So off the bat, start clock, first baseman catches it, 4.1. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a roller, a free hopper, or it is a rocket, that's the, that's the time. Now, whether I do that with arm strength, whether I do that with my feet, or with my transfer, how smooth I am, my transitions, that's fine. But if I'm, being, if I'm in high school, and I'm a shortstop from a high school team, but I'm still can't get a guy out, and everything I, everything I throw, when I time myself is 4.8 seconds, 4.7, 4.5, 4.8, you're not going to throw. The, the runners, they're just the speed of it, you know, you're not going to do that. So I believe at first it, it is obviously physical stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the physical stuff, <clears throat> I think they go into the academics part of it. And I know that academics should come first, and it does. But I'm saying there's no point, even if there's no yeah. point looking at somebody academics if they can't play. Yeah. There should be a right, reason so, to look at you first, and then you look at you. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So if they, they look at you and they go, man, the kid looks pretty physical. He looks like a durable athlete, and um, he could probably withstand, you know, 45 to 60 game season and all the training we do. Um, we've seen him hit. We've seen him run, throw, jump, and all that stuff, and it passes all that test. Then it goes into, you know, <clears throat> do his teammates cheer for him? Mm-hmm. Does he does he cheer? Care for his teammates. You you can see a lot about a guy. If a guy's real selfish, you know you know the players out yeah. there. That are super selfish. They don't root for anybody when when they just care about when they're up hit, do, doing something big. Um, I think that that's a part of because in a college game when you get there and everybody's good, then they want to see if you can you know if you gotta if you have to sit in the bench and learn and rock for a year, are you going to be a toxic you know you know what, yeah. of, or are you going to be able to say you know what? I'm going to grind this out. I'm going to work my ass off. And, I, and when I get my opportunity, I'm going to go show out. You know, um, w- yeah. one of the, I think uh, when you said the last part was, what do kids not know? I think I've had this question several times. And um, at, you know, bigger events that I've been at where guys were looking at, where different college coaches would come over to my dugout um, before the game starts and says, well, who do you got, Ferbs, right? And I'd start highlighting guys. Okay, this guy's a shortstop. He's a lefty stick. He's a 3.7 GPA. He's pretty good. He might need to add a couple of pounds of size. You know, this guy's a center fielder. He's a 6'5 runner. He's really fast, but he's hitting. He needs, he needs to work on his hitting a little bit, but this is what you're going to get. I've had a couple of times where coaches go, Ferg, who's the toughest guy on your team? And I say, what do you mean tough? Right? Because you yeah. got to think about it. You mean mentally tough? No. I mean, like, if you were walking down the street and – two guys or three guys jumped you or you were in a barn and guys jumped you, who on your team would you want to be which? which right? Yeah. And uh, you start thinking about guys and, and you see that, you know, they, it's probably a result of a lot, they, you know, a lot of times this day and age, kids become, they train a lot, right? And they practice and they become really toolsy and they have good metrics. And so when they go to a showcase, they, they're hitting balls out of the stadium they got good loft and carry on. It's loud and and um, they run fast. They're built well, and when they get into game situations or when it's not going their way, you can see they kind of just melt away. Definitely. You know, so I think that's definitely that's definitely part of it is is being physically and mentally tough. You know, and being able because they, they they you know you, you're dealing with guys that are 21 years old in college, 22 years old. These are grown men that they go hard. You know, and you want to make sure guys come in and, and they can compete. Yeah, d- definitely. As we talk about the recruiting process, recruiting process as we go on, how early should kids be sending emails out? At like what age? I would say for the ages of sending it out, I think that really depends on what your, you know, what your videos look like, what your email is going to say about you. If if I'm a if I'm a freshman in high school and I'm five seven one thirty, yeah, I don't think I would I don't think I would start sending emails at that point. You know, I would I would start I would take the time I would be trying to think about what schools and email emailing what coaches and I would go eat a couple of triple cheeseburgers and go to the gym. And get, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I would spend my time doing because 
I want when, ultimately when you send something out for any job that you're looking for, you want a response. You want people to look at it and go, "Man, yeah. this dude looks like a good candidate." Yeah, they want their eyes to get open. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, how important is it for kids to go to WWA like Florida and Georgia to tournaments? I think I think it's important. Um, I don't think it's you know. I think you can also you can also get where you want to get without doing it if you absolutely can, depending if you're good enough. I'll tell you the things it's good for um, that I've seen in the past. One is if let's just say you, you're from the Northeast, right? Yeah. You know? So certain guys, different families have different amounts of money they're working with as far as resources to to be able to get their kid exposure. Definitely. You, maybe maybe a kid that you, is on your team, his family has enough money where they can send him to a camp at UCLA or Arizona State or Stanford, even if he lives in the Northeast, right? And he can go to 10 different camps. His family has an unlimited amount of money, and they can just say, all right, hey, are you want to go to Oregon? Cool, no problem. You know, we'll go out there, we'll book the camp and go, and then we'll spend $1,000 on plane tickets and the whole nine, yeah. the whole nine yards. Um, Georgia, at, going to Georgia with some of these bigger national events, those guys will come to you and be able to see if that's if it's one option to be able to save, you know, maybe four or five different recruiting trips, right? To go to go yeah. to different colleges at camps, um, and they're all at the same place. Uh, now, just because you go there doesn't mean they're going to come watch you. But if you have a, a, a good network and you've been communicating with coaches and they know, you know, you've had some relationship and back and forth and, and they've given the schedule and you're on point about it. And you say, you know, if I'm a pitcher, I'm going to be pitching. You talk to your coach, you make sure it's all done. You say, I'm pitching game three. This is the time. This is the school I'm at. This is the, this is the location. Um, you can get guys, a, a lot of colleges at once to come watch you um, at, at, a, <laughs> at a colleges that you normally wouldn't see. Yeah. So I, I'm over here in California now and um, there are – you know, the kids that are around here, typically the really good kids, you know, UCLA and Cal, Stanford, um, th these are, are a lot of, these are the kind of the programs that see these guys a lot, which you would probably not see those guys that much. Yeah. Easier for them to recruit kids that are in state. They can see them more than keep an eye on them. They can talk to the high school coaches. Maybe they can even go to a high school game and watch yeah. them play. So that stuff's important. And, um, I think that's one of it is the exposure level and also the competition level. Mm -hmm. right? It's it's hard to get a you know SEC program, a school to come watch your high school game, even if you're really really good. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard to convince them to come to a high school game if you don't know what pitcher is going to be throwing. If you're a hitter, let's say, if I'm a hitter and I want them to fly to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but when they come there for the trip, the college, whatever college it is, the kid's topping at 81. Yeah. Definitely. On a varsity, that happens sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Or it rains. Yeah. Yeah, it, that, that's brutal. I've seen it happen before. I've gotten, I've gotten Duke, Virginia, all these people, uh, NC State. I've gotten a lot of different programs. Wake Forest to, to when, if say they're playing University of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. right? Um, or Boston College, might, they might be able to fly in a day early and catch a high school game with a kid in the area that's three, four, four hours from thing, and they'll drive there yeah. before the weekend series starts, and they'll go watch them in high school. But you, you can get into some, you know, it, it's risky because of weather and because you don't know uh, what you're going to see, and it's hard to evaluate a hitter when a guy is topping an 81 and he can't throw a curveball for a strike. Yeah. So that's why that's why it's become more efficient. Right, it's. I don't. I think people look at it as if, oh man, they're just stealing your money. Well, you can look at it that way, but the, for the guys that get recruited from there, they get a scholarship, and the scholarship's forty percent of seventy thousand dollar a year school. I guess when you get thinking about getting thirty thousand a year in scholarship money um, for four years, it's one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Right. So. Is it really them stealing money, or have you got a return on your investment? I, 
it's individual based. Whether whatever you got out of it was what it was. Now, if you just went down there <clears throat> and you had no coach to communicate to these people, nobody was reaching out to them. You were getting no feedback from the guy from the travel yeah. team. It could be it could be horrendous, a, a real bad experience. Yeah. Uh, with that, how you were talking about like you invest the money and then you get the money as like the scholarship. With the PBR and Perfect Game, you have the same feelings about those events, like showcases. Um, I think it's, you know, it could be again. I think it's helpful for the guys that use the right way. Any of these things, Kyle, are tools. Yeah. Right. So how I, if you use a tool better than I use a tool, then it's different. You, you, you might have a chainsaw. Me and you might both have two chainsaws. You know how to use it. Yeah. Right. So you go and chop down a bunch of trees real fast and you're done with your work and right, you're good. You use the tool correctly. Yeah. I don't know how to use it and all of a sudden I chop my hand off. Yeah. Same tool. Mm -hmm. Two different people you right? So so we want to so you, you and, and that's it. That tool goes with everything, not just the recruiting stuff. Throwing weighted balls, training, um, these are all training tools. Uh, data hit track. One guy uses it the right way; he gets good benefits from it. Another guy uses it the wrong way, and he gets domed, or he's off. He's doing something. He's chasing exit velocity, yeah. or he's swinging. Out. So, I think PPR and perfect game can be useful. Um, I've also seen kids get off track, and what happens is they keep trying to get. They, they're using it because they want to get their ranking up. Yeah, definitely. And and um, chasing the rankings that. Usually, I've never seen that go well. When guys, when kids keep on looking at the ranking, you know, where, how come they didn't even mention me? All this, you know what I mean? You get lost in that. And yeah, it could potentially become uh, a problem for you mentally, just, just, just focusing on all the wrong things. Mm -hmm. I agree. I know you've talked about this a little bit, but what is your goal as a coach to players? I know your goal you kind of said was to get them recruited, but dig a little deeper in more what you're trying to do. Oh, I want to give my guys a feeling of that they can be able to escape from whatever stressful parts of their life it is. That's why it, 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 it's, it hurts when you see kids that are super stressed out during the recruiting process because yeah. I, I feel like my purpose is to give you an escape, players like yourself, to be able to, you can go somewhere and you can be free. You can have a nickname. You can go yell and do crazy stuff that you can't do in school, right? right. When you're on a, when you're on a baseball field, and so I think that um, one of the goals is it, it becomes tough to, to to create that because a lot of kids it's, they naturally get stressed out with the recruiting process and they start focusing on that rather than. Am I having a great experience? Am I waking up every morning enjoying what I'm doing? Am I waking up every morning passionate and driven to succeed every day? Am I motivated, right? Or am I, am I just trying to get a scholarship so I can please my dad? Or I can post something and feel like I got a little clout? And these are, you know, and honestly, if I was your age with all the stuff that's going on, and if I don't, if I don't have probably good guidance and good coaches and, and a good support network, I could see it's easy, it's easy for kids to get off track. And people say, man, why are these kids doing, why are these kids acting like that? What do you mean? If I, if I don't even know what you guys are going through because I never, when I was in high school, either your high school coach knew a college or the college coaches or somebody would be looking at the stats on the news in, in like the local newspaper. Yeah. They would hear about a guy, man, he's doing really good. This guy could be an All-American or whatever. He's, his kid's batting 450. His kid's batting 420. He's a beast. And then they would come see you. They didn't even have perfect game. Yeah. There was no there was no showcase. There was nothing. You know, there was no phone. There was no ranking. There was none of it. So, uh, you know, with, with, on another thing is it allowed me to enjoy the game a little bit more because mm -hmm. I was comparing myself you know, you we as baseball players, we compare ourselves to our peers. It's the only way that yeah. you can compare. What are the guys in my neighborhood like? How good am I compared to the next guy in my neighborhood or, or the school? The school over, right? Mm -hmm. 
If you think you, where do you live? What city? I'm a uh, Monroe, Monroe Woodbury, next to Woodbury Commons. Okay, so how many people do you think live there? Like the population? Do you know? How many idea? I don't know. Maybe like fourteen k. Like that might be totally off. And I'm gonna say like no, fourteen k. Fourteen thousand in your city? It's not a city. It's a it's suburbs. Oh, the suburbs. Okay, but like in, in that whole area. All right, let's say it's twenty thousand, right? Yeah. People. So out of twenty thousand people, you probably got. I don't know. Uh, three or four thousand yeah. high school kids. High school, high school age kids, maybe. Yeah. Right, maybe high three, three or four thousand high school age kids. All right, out of those three or four thousand high school age kids, maybe five hundred of them play even play baseball. Yeah. Right. So, so now, you, Kyle, are comparing yourself, like I would be compared if I was you, five hundred kids. Right. Yeah. Look around and you go. Am I in the top? Am I in the bottom? Half? Am I in the top half? Well, I'm in the top half. Am I in the top hundred? Am I in the top fifty? Am I in the top ten? Where do I have to shoot for? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, right? In my opinion, <clears throat> that's a normal <clears throat> range of people, of kids and peers that I would compare myself to. Mm-hmm. Do I throw as hard as the, the best kid out of those five hundred, or am I a little bit down, or am I over? What? These days, if I'm looking on Instagram. There's two million amateur baseball players in America. Mm-hmm. Two, okay. So when you're looking at those numbers, and I start comparing myself, all I see on Instagram, and social media, is this dude just committed to Vanderbilt. This dude just committed to Mississippi State. This dude just committed to LSU. Yeah, but where is he from? Oh, he's from Arkansas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, well, it's like, what, what does that have to do with me? Yeah. Uh-huh. He's in Arkansas. I live in Brooklyn. I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm comparing myself to millions of people, which is just not a, a good, I don't think, I don't think it's a good kind of measure, measurement yeah. to be doing. So I would first go back to your question. I would first, if I was you, I would gauge myself off of the kids that were in the neighborhood first after my neighborhood, my city. Okay, mm-hmm. and if really good, if I was one of the best kids in my city, then I would start looking at my state. Right, yeah. that's I feel like it's something normal. Um, if I'm if if I'm supposed if I'm at the age where I'm looking at kids in my neighborhood, but instead I'm looking at kids across the whole country and kids in Japan and, and Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Again, that's it's not it's not realistic. So. I think if you can dominate those kids in your in your own city, then you start looking further. But that's who you get kids you got to beat first. Yeah, I agree. Uh, for our next question, what is the most influential thing or lesson you have learned from a pro player? The most influential lesson, well, I think getting the feedback of what it's really like in professional baseball is eye-opening and I think when you're growing up when you're your age you have one idea of what that is and when you're actually in it you go through it you go oh wow that wasn't exactly what I expected and I think one of the one of the things that you one of the things that I've learned from seeing players that were incredible players I mean from their age they dominated everybody mm-hmm. from Little League to high school, junior high school, travel ball, high school, um, college, just crushed everybody. Way better. Right? I, I know players that are like this. They were players that played on Team USA. Yeah. Right? And they get to Pro Bowl and they fail miserably. And they don't know Can't how to react, right? Well, not only don't know how to react, they end up getting released, and you get fired. Your job that you thought was your job, that was your career, and your whole life, the only thing you put in the center of everything was, I am a baseball player, that's who I am first, yeah. right? So, it's sometimes, it's it's tough to watch sometimes, because 
think about it. You went, you go from being the guy on your team where no matter what, you're starting. You're in the game. Every every inning of every game, can't play without this guy. Need him. No matter if he's sick, this, if he's even a little injured, he's probably better than everybody else too. Just just get him there. Mm-hmm. You're you are the centerpiece of this role, right? Of a role. You're you're a leader. And you do things the right way. And then one day somebody says, after literally after 20 years, right? Or 15 to 20 years of you being that guy. Yeah. One day, one day somebody goes up to you and says, Hey man, check it out. We don't have enough at bats for you for, to go around. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? It means you're released. Here's your pink slip. Have a good day. And they leave you at a bus stop. Right? Yeah. So, so the, the, I guess the gratitude and the, the, the things that I've learned from that is being able to appreciate every moment. And this also could happen with an injury. Yeah. Right? I mean, this isn't just performance-based. I know guys that were really, really good and talented that they got sidetracked with girls. Maybe they got pregnant in college. Yeah. What are you going to do? You get a girl pregnant in college, and you're either going to, A, not live up to your responsibilities as a father because I'm going to go play baseball and go try to go pro instead of working and feeding my kid. I don't know if that's a good option. I don't think that anybody thinks that that would be something that you would respect, correct? Yeah. No, you would probably say, well, you chose to do that, and so baseball's over. Now it's time to go out and grind and work and get a paycheck like everybody else. Mm-hmm. So I think, um, you know, that that's one of the things I, I, I take away from all things. It, it, it happens fast, you know, and, and f- you think a year's long and then five years go by and that's gone, 10 years go by and it's just, it, it all just, just a blur, right? And so trying to, trying to stay right now instead of thinking about what's going to happen or thinking about what happened yesterday, it's, it's a skill. Is a, is a complete skill to, you know, waking up every day and, and feeling, appreciating your health. You can see, you can play, you can go play a game and all this other stuff. That's a, I don't think that people, you don't think about it until it's gone. And then one day it's gone. Yeah. Right. I'm telling you, what are you, a senior in high school? I'm a junior. Right. Oh, you're a junior. <laughs> so. You got a crew. You got a crew of, uh, of of guys you kick it with at school. Yeah. You got a crew, right? You think about your crew of guys. How many guys in your crew that you would like say those are my boys? Probably like six. Six. Okay, that's about similar. I think most kids are like that. Like I got six dudes. I can kick it with any one of them or all of them at one time, yeah. right? Some of them are baseball players, probably. Yeah. Some of them are not, right? Maybe they play another sport, or maybe they're just another kid that's not a sporty guy, but he's just cool, yeah. right? Just. So there's going to come a day, right? Because right now when you're in it, it's just automatic. You don't think about it. You're like, what, what's like, what's one of your boys' names? Uh, AJ. AJ, right? What, what is, what, is he the same grade? Yeah, baseball player. Baseball player. So right now in your mind, when you're bored or you want to go hit or you want to go play catch or you just want to go kick it at the mall, you just go, AJ, what up? Yeah. You want to go kick or snap them, or, or text them, right? Mm-hmm. I promise you that one day, okay, either you are going to be moving somewhere and doing something else with your life, whether it's baseball or whether it's a career, He AJ also will be, hopefully, get married, maybe having a kid at some point. Yeah. But there... There is a there is a there is a specific line of time where people where where all of us we go the squad is over all my guys from high school I might I still might hit them on like a, a DM or something once a year I might go hey man hope your family's doing good mm-hmm. once a year a text hey man cool but people move away they go different places and they go in different directions they get families they get jobs so you you know. That's why it's so hard to, to not to, to, to not appreciate. I had such great memories of what had, kicking with those guys, but one day it just goes. I wish somebody would tell be able to tell you, hey man, this is a, I'm able to kick it with AJ, mm-hmm. right? 
but but uh, it's tough to stay to stay like that. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, how much do you think the mental side of the game affects people, and what are the what are ways people can become mentally stronger? Um, well, everything starts. You can't do much without the, the your 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 mind being healthy. Um, I think it affects pretty much everything. But so you're saying. How, so, tell me the question one more time. You're saying the from a mental perspective, how important is it? Yeah, let's say you have a kid, right? He's on the mound. He throws a bad pitch. He gets in his head. That bad body language. Like, how? What are ways? How does it? How does the mental side of the game affect people? And what are ways people could become mentally stronger? Well, I think the first thing is obviously. When we, when we practice for any, any skill, nobody cares about practice, right? Nobody, nobody, no spectator, let's just say, really cares about practice. You care about what happens in the game, mm -hmm. right? So preparing, preparing and your preparation in order to go, go compete, um, it's crucial for mental, for, for your mental uh, state and also what your confidence level is. And it goes both ways. So... I might not be guaranteed that I'm going to have the greatest game of my life if I, you know, practice every single day, get all my work in, get my nutrition right, um, make sure I hit, make sure I get my arm, arm right, uh, I'm, I'm sleeping uh, properly and all this other stuff. doesn't guarantee that I'm going to have a good game. But it takes away that one big question mark of am I as prepared as the next guy out here, right? So, so my confidence... That's the word I was looking for, confidence. Yeah, my confidence is based on me not lying to myself, mm -hmm. okay? So when I, when I say I lie to myself, it means when I say I'm going to go do legs today at the gym, I got to get my leg works in, hack squats, deadlifts, and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and I either go to the gym and I kind of like do a half ass job and then like say, oh, I like biceps more so I'm gonna do my biceps mm -hmm. right or if I don't go and I skip a day if I say if my plan was I'm supposed to go hit and I don't hit that's lying to myself and when I lie to myself it chips away at my confidence yeah right so that's why when we talk about setting attainable goals I just set small goals and little tiny wins and when I say you know I'm gonna make sure that I eat enough calories today to be able to put on the weight that I need to put on this off season, mm -hmm. and I do it, I win. So I think that kind of stuff is 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 uh, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Also, um, making sure that making sure that I have balance in my life um, when it comes to how much time I'm um, messing around. Because you don't, I don't think it's good to be doing anything that much. So the guys that are just going. Man, all I do is train, you know, don't even call me, all my friends, I don't have, I, you, you're not on my level, I don't have any friends, I go, I go do my all my work, and that's it, I'm just a baseball player, I don't think that's good either, I think it's good to have hobbies, I think it's good to have, you know, a girlfriend if that's good for you, not for everybody, you know what I mean, yeah. but if, 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 um, if it doesn't take away from your center focus, then you can do a lot of things. You know, I would just say that, that, um, you know, if I'm wasting all my brain cells on watching YouTube videos, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, I don't leave any, any of that motivational stuff or anything that enjoyable stuff that I want to do. Um, if I don't leave it any left for, for the stuff, my passion that I'm, that I want to uh, pursue, then, you know, you can, I see guys that, that, that are easily, Definitely, you can tell the difference between players that are guys that get down more than other guys. Some mm -hmm. guys just have to shake it and just keep going. And other guys, they, I think they, I think the difference is whether you feel you look externally or you look internally. Um, well, and I'll give you a, uh, an example. Like um, a young, young hitter might, if he was taking around a BP and there was a bunch of people around, 
right? Teammates, college coaches, scout, the coach, and all this other stuff, right? Young, young player, if he swings and misses twice in a row in BP, okay? Or, and then he fouls off the next two or three, and he can't catch a barrel. I think the guys that start looking externally, they start looking around and saying, who, who just saw that? Is anybody watching? Right? Yeah. Now my, my heart rate starts elevating. My breathing is all messed up. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about something that has nothing to do with the task. My, the task is I got to square up this next baseball. But if I'm thinking about other things and what people think about me, then it's going to throw me really way off. So the pro guys that you work with, you can see those guys. If they're not thinking about who they, they're like, I don't give a shit who's yeah. watching. I don't care. What difference does that make? I'm trying to work on something here. So what do I got to do? So that's when they'll, they'll take a second, refocus and get back in there and they won't keep on rolling over or the, the, the difference is they, they just, they don't keep doing the same thing. They won't roll over two, three times in a row. It just doesn't happen with pro guys. It's, yeah, it's definitely fair to say for myself, I could fall into that. I fall into that too. With Which one? Looking, looking around, who's watching? Yeah. Like I, I'm not afraid to say it. I gotta work it, on that. I, I'm getting better at it, but just a level of focus when you're like, I can't, I don't give a shit anymore. It's just like, I'm. They're watching me. I have to perform. Like that's it. That's it. it I'm, it's re- I really like the fact and respect the fact that you were just honest about what is actually going on. Because when I'm honest about it, then I, I, I get more comfortable. It's just, at least I'm being honest. I know that the dude next to me is feeling the same thing, but he's not honest about it. Yeah. If anybody would be because you want to make your coaches proud. You want to, your, your parents... When you leave the field, be like, man, that was a man. You look great out there today. Three, four with two ribbies, man, and you made that play in the field. You want to get that, right? But that can't be the main focus. That has to be something that's kind of secondary. Yeah. To to the number, the, the first couple of things I got to check in with myself with are, how was my attitude today? What was my effort level like? That I can't control. I can control how much effort I'm putting on every play. I can control how much I'm talking to my teammates and how much I'm picking guys up. I can control, um, you know, what what my body language is doing. I can't control getting a hit. If I hit if I hit three balls right hard right at different people, it sucks. But you know what? I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if I can't control it, I don't want to waste even one minute of my life thinking about it yeah why would i it's just a, it's it's a waste of time now i got a quick question this one's a, just a quick one your favorite yep. mlb player favorite mlb player ever or currently uh currently currently man that's a good one you know what you know he struggled a little bit this year. I might really like watching Juan Soto play. Yeah. Not the best defender, and I think they kind of gave him a gold glove for no reason because he didn't look that good. But uh, I like how I like his passion and I like the way he approaches it. I feel like he he has a lot of fun when he plays, and I like his approach to play for being so young. I think it's impressive. Um, I mean, I guess I gotta throw in Shohei just because he's freakish, and I've never seen anybody do what he does. Yeah. When you when you coach, you've been around the game for that long, and you look at it, and you say, "There's nobody ever in the history of baseball that's ever impacted the game, a game, the way that he does with the skill set that he has." Yeah. Now, with that being said, and about these MLB players, with all these kids looking up to them. How important is it for youth ages, like six to ten years old, to have a real deal baseball coach? And uh, how hard is it to find one? What what should kids uh, ages six through ten be doing in baseball too? Well, I've been working with some younger guys recently and trying to, you know, you, you start to see that 
our game is in, it's in really big need of the guys that have just stopped playing and that are real still kind of um, connected to the game and, and can still hit a little bit <clears throat> to work with those younger guys because, you know, <clears throat> it is – it's you have to have the dads to be able to coach and volunteer, but – it's a different thing when the, the kids look at it a lot different when they have a guy that's a ex pro player or a current pro player than a guy that is a dad. It just is. Anybody would look at it differently. Um, I think uh, having a having a kid, you know, making sure that I don't think you, you don't need to win at eight years old. You don't have to win every game, but in order. It, it only takes one coach to kind of drain all the fun out of it at that age, too. So you want a guy with feel to come in there and be able to um, at least teach routine things, but also with making it fun to boring. Baseball is it's a little bit boring, if you, especially if you're a young kid. Maybe not for guys like me and you that have been around it long enough to yeah. go. I, I don't need anybody to show me how fun this is. But for a kid that's just starting out, and he's he's a kind of a, he's a pretty good athlete, and he, he gets happens to get some dad that that thinks he's uh, you know trying to win a trying to win a, a World Series ring. You know what I mean? It might not be so fun for a seven or eight year old kid to do that. Mm-hmm. I, I, look, I, I've been looking at this interesting uh, thing because I've been watching. If you watch super young baseball players like T ball, coach pitch, like that stuff, you'll you notice that a lot of the play, a lot of the, a lot of the, the best hitters mm-hmm. or righties will develop more of a pull side swing. They won't really hit the ball hard the opposite way, right? Yeah. Uh, at that young, young age, and I think some of it has to do with um, when you're, you know, when you're in T-ball, or whatever. That like the one place you don't want to hit it, the easiest play to make is second base, right? A ground yeah. ball to second base. That's going to be the easiest play to make in, in T-ball. So you're actually rewarded for like rolling over to the shortstop or third baseman. Sometimes they won't get you out a lot of mm-hmm. times, right? Yeah. The younger. Just can't make so, it. Out, can't feel it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a tough play. Like you play. just got to run it out. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of kids develop more of a pull side swing because you're rewarded that, and it's just a little more rotational. I just wonder what would happen if, like, there was a. a in, in Little League or something, like, you reversed which way you ran. Mm. Like, every other game. Every other game. So, like, you, like, right as you run to third base, and you would try to hit a ball hard that way or try to hit a line drive that the other way to get to third. It would be confusing, I'm saying, but I'm just talking about from a swing perspective and developing kids into being more well-rounded hitters, right? Yeah. It, might, it might, might be interesting as a case study. I like that a lot, actually. Interesting. Mm-hmm. In closing, I want to say I really appreciate you, Coach Ferbs, for yeah. taking bit for uh, taking your time and spending it on the KML interview. Um, appreciate how generous and uh, sincere you are, and how honest you are about the game. And I'm sure all these fans are gonna appreciate everything you've said and it's going to change their aspect of baseball appreciate it